Hello and welcome. I'm Anna Baskerville, Development Director and Fellow at Sydney Sussex. And please let me start by thanking you for joining us for the inaugural Sydney Insights. The purpose of this new event is to showcase the diversity of the college community by platforming a range of experiences and perspectives. We're very excited that our guests today are Paddy Lowe and Carol Waterman, both are engineering alumni at Sydney. And furthermore, Paddy is one of our honorary fellows and Carol, a fellow commoner. Over the next hour, Carol will be asking Paddy a range of questions about his career and the new development of synthetic fuels, followed by a chance for you to ask questions. I'd now like to pass over to them. Thank you again. Thank you very much indeed, Anna. And it is an absolute delight to be involved in this inaugural event of uh, Sydney Insights. I uh, studied engineering. My name is Carol Vorderman. I studied engineering at Sydney from 78 to 81. Um, and then the engineers handed on the baton to the 1981 uh, to 84 contingent. Uh, oh, <laughs> that's how we do it. Yeah. <laughs> was our Hi, Carol. <laughs> Hi, darling. Was our wonderful Paddy Lowe. Um, I'm sure that everybody watching is as, uh, as enthusiastic and as in love with our college as we are. Um, it, I know it provided me with just the most incredible opportunity of my life really uh, coming from a comprehensive school up in north wales on free school meals and uh mr green donald green i thank you donald green uh accepted me so i was very grateful for that so um i know that many people watching uh, studied engineering at Sydney. So there are names like Keith Glover and Anne Dowling, who we will be talking about at some point. But I want to introduce Paddy Lowe to you. Uh, I'm sure that everybody uh, watching knows uh, of his world-class achievements in Formula One. So Paddy studied engineering from 81 to 84, and talk about that in a second, uh, was uh, chief engineer of, of uh, various uh, Formula One teams, Williams, McLaren, Mercedes, um, and is now a co-founder of a stunning startup. Um, it's quite an extraordinary startup uh, called Zero Petroleum, um, which is already producing fossil-free liquid fuels. And uh, late last year, um, achieved the Guinness, uh, Guinness World Record for the first flight ever using uh, synthetic, I hate that word synthetic fuels, but a fossil free uh, petroleum. Um, and it, it's quite extraordinary. And this is just the beginning for Paddy. So we've got lots and lots and lots to talk about. But first of all, Paddy, welcome to Sydney Insights. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> yeah, tremendous to be the first on this show, isn't it? It's a really, really good thing to, to connect with the college and connect with alumni of, of all stages, I think, in, in history. Uh, or recent history at least, in yeah. the college. And as you say, for me, it's a real privilege to have attended Sydney. Um, you know, it was a short period of time in years, but, you know, very, very long period of time in my memory. And I think like, I would imagine that's the case for all the alumni that are listening today. And Sydney gave you a massive opportunity too, didn't it? You'd gone to Seven Oaks School uh, on a free placement back in the 70s. Yeah, it's very lucky because that's a very, very expensive school, actually, <laughs> to, to go to then and now. Um, but for some strange reason, the council had a few uh, free places there and I got one of them. So, yeah, I had a tremendous education at Seven Oaks, um, which put me in great shape to get to Cambridge. Actually, we were one of the first years that could get through on a conditional offer. Yeah. So we didn't have to do the exams. Uh, the Oxbridge exams, which had existed prior to that. So my offer was um, three, I think it was three A's or, or even four A's and two ones they wanted, In which I thought well, that, that's never going to happen, but you know, <laughs> you well be offering. But I actually did get that, so it was, was, was really chuffed to get in. <laughs> oh, well done. Yes, I was lucky. I got a conditional offer coming from a comprehensive, and I think that's something that we just wanted to mention to everyone, because Sydney... Sussex stands for that, I think, in terms of equality across all strata of uh, secondary education. And it's something that, that the college has yeah. held dear since it's inception. I feel the college was a pioneer in many ways of, of that, you know, the open access and diversity certainly felt that way when we were there. So, mister, uh, 
we can always talk about Sydney Sussex and all of those principles forever and a day. But today we are here to talk about engineering and to talk about your career, which started as an engineer in Sydney Sussex with Professor Keith Glover and, uh, and uh, Dame Professor uh, Anne Dowling and others. And little Paddy Lowe yeah. turned up all, all fresh behind the ears, all clean behind the ears. And what was it like when you started engineering? I mean, th they were my two supervisors, actually. And what, what an amazing lineup, if you think, think about it. <laughs> Anne Dowling and, and Keith Glover. Yeah. Um, and, so, and I have to, you know, I was not an exemplary student, unfortunately. Um, I think the highlight of my engineering career in, in, in uh, Sydney was the structures. To those who've done engineering, you, you may recall or, or have experienced the structures in first year, uh, which was a show really. I think every Wednesday morning they would crush people's handiwork uh, in a big vice um, in front of everybody who was watching. So it was a, almost a medieval entertainment of the week. <laughs> that, that week's victims put forward their structures. Um, but actually, I, I and my partner did pretty well with that, and I actually got a structures prize from that. So that that was my um, probably my best achievement in, <laughs> the years in terms of the academic work. Um, but it's a really good, fun project, actually. You know, very satisfying. So one of the things, obviously, that many of us will remember who are as old as us, uh, Paddy, I'm older than you, but anyway, um, is that when we started doing engineering there, we had to program in uh, Fortran, I think it was, wasn't it? And, and had yes. these, like, little punched cards that would record our efforts of coding. Um, was that the same when you were there? It certainly was when I was Yeah, I think we, we must have been one of the last years that used card programs. programs. Um, but that's right. You, know, you wrote your lines in Fortran, which is a pretty ancient language in today's world. Yeah. And, and each line of the program was one card, which would be punched out and it was fed into a card reader. And that, that was your program. And it, it ran and it sort of added numbers up or whatever you wanted to do to show that you, know, you could do it. Um, and and uh, the results would come out on a printer or th there might have been some sort of video screen, but it, it was all very black and white, very, very archaic. Um, we did actually, in our period, we were working on microprocessors already though as well. So we were programming uh, microprocessors directly in assembler as, as part of our practical work. Um, and that was really, really good fun. Uh, but it was, it was the beginning of, of the computer age. Yeah. Yeah, at school, we'd been using the BBC Micro. Some people may recall that. And that, that was a very, very early computer, um, but very, very accessible, you know, even to, to people at school age. And, you know, a lot of people, that's where I learned my computing actually was on the BBC Micro. And, and that was fundamentally what, what, which we'll go on to, which is what gave you that, insight into control engineering. As you say, you were starting to work with microprocessors. Uh, and then this fantastic career in Formula One. Yeah. But before we come on to that, please tell me, because I'm convinced, and I don't know if it's still the case at Sydney, that the vast majority of people who were in the various rowing boats, men's uh, first, and certainly uh, women's first, because I was one of, I was a, I think second or third girl to study engineering there, was the vast majority were engineers and the boat club captains seemed to be. And I, and you were definitely, I remember, in one of the boats. Tell me about that. Yeah, I, I actually only rowed. I didn't row anywhere. It was the Cox. <laughs> so, <laughs> I didn't row technically, but I was I only did it in my last term, which is, a, which is terrific because summer term, and I got the first boat to Cox, so you get all the great time on the river, which would be, you know, the warm summer evening, rather than, you know, breaking the ice on the early shift in winter. Uh, so we actually had great fun that term. Um, just one highlight, the May bumps that year, we were, uh, I think, third or fourth in the second division. Yeah. And it's a very, very uh, big story, which ought to be better recorded, but... 
Jesus College, Jesus One, were late to station um, and they turned up with a minute to go. And at that point, they started spinning the boat. And it doesn't matter what you do, how hard you row, what it takes two minutes to spin the boat. Um, so you can guess what, you know, the gun went off and they were right across the river. It was absolute carnage. I mean, <laughs> there were bodies jumping in, <laughs> in the river, broken blades, broken boats. We were okay because we were far enough ahead to just not even start. We knew what was going on. So it was an incredible scene. So they, they got an overbump for that, but uh, yeah, that was the highlight. I love all of that. Anyway, right, we best crack on because I've set my timer. So there's a 20 to 3, everybody. We're going to uh, go to our questions and answers, aren't we, Paddy? Uh, very strictly then. So anything that we miss out, you can ask us about and we'll deal with in the question and answer session. So from uh, leaving, from graduating uh, from Sydney, you joined Metalbox. You were already with Metalbox under a sponsorship agreement. And then I'm just going to kind of shift on from that because I know that when you left, you had no particular ambition whatsoever, other than that you were interested in these things called microprocessors. Um, but what happened in 1987, that's when you did something that would effectively change your life. Um, actually, I was, I was sitting in a pub with my friend, um, Eddie Dent, who is uh, an alumnus, um, and he said, why don't you work for a Formula One team, which had never, it never occurred to me that real people might do such an interesting job. And actually, in fact, if you'd gone into a careers office in those days and said you wanted to work in Formula One, they'd have given you a very strange look indeed. <clears throat> you know, that was not a career. <laughs> now, it would be very different. You know, many engineers see that as a, a, you know, an aspirational um, well, job at least, not necessarily career, but you know, it, it's a very high tech industry and seen as such. But back then it was a really quite a back shed, homegrown, homemade type of industry uh, and well behind the curve relative to you know, the established automotive and aerospace industries for you know, relevant technology. And they, they were still terrific cars, very exciting, but they were not as technical as they are today by any stretch. Um, so, yeah, he said, I wrote, there wasn't an internet back then to speak of. How do you, you know, how do you contact Formula One teams? It was all by word of mouth. Uh, so I managed to scrape together addresses for three teams, three technical directors, and I just wrote on spec, sent a CV and only one replied, which was Williams, and I got a job there in late 87. Um, as a control engineer, as you say, I have done that paper in my final year, and I've always, you know, loved that. That's the part of engineering I love most. Um, to those who don't, who don't are not familiar, control is about uh, making things happen, really. Um, so, you know, the central heating in your house has a thermostat that controls the temperature, so it's automatic. That's a great example of a simple control system. Um, and one where if you don't turn it to maximum, that doesn't make it heat any quicker on the thermostat to those who don't understand thermostats. <laughs> so, but that, that's the engineering now. Um, so, you know, taking that, closing that loop, um, these days is all done with a computer. And those were the very early days of starting to bring computers into play. Um, prior to that, it was very much mechanical. Even, the, you know, even if you look at the Apollo program, the, those Saturn rockets, the, the vector thrusting of those was controlled mechanically. So it's a mechanical loop to, to vector the jets, but all done with computers now. And the great thing about control is, you, you know, in the end, you're the, the kind of Rick Waitman that pulls it all together. You're in charge of all this stuff, even though other people have done all the bits around it. So, you know, at the end of the day, you make it work. And that, that's what, you know, that's really satisfying. So Williams at that time were developing, amongst other things, their active uh, suspension program. And that's when you kind of, you know, you went in there. But just describe to me, as you have before, that F1 in those days was more like a bit of a cottage industry rather than 
as we would perceive it today, which is, you know, the, the, the absolute pinnacle, if you like, of, of a lot of different kinds of engineering. Yeah, we were, it was very early days to bring in proper engineering, if I could call it that. Um, so we were really under-resourced at the end of the day. Um, I, would, I did a job then that nowadays would be done by about 30 people, which doesn't mean I'm brilliant, it just meant that I did it badly. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, as long as you did it well, well or, or better than, than the other teams, you know, that's how you won. Um, Formula One has grown at almost 10% per annum over that 30 year period um, by any metric. And, you know, one of those would be income. So, you know, that all Formula One teams all exist to win. So they mostly spend all their income on whatever it takes to win. So that's gone into engineering and technology. So over that period, we've seen a transition uh, where Formula One is now very, very sophisticated and in many aspects is far ahead of, of other industries to which you might compare it. Um, and it has the advantage that it, it's really self-policing, self-controlling. So um, th there's not a great, great burden of um, certification to do things quickly. Let's put it like that. Right. Um, yeah. You know, teams broadly uh, maintain their own safety standards as they feel responsible to do, um, and, but they can move quickly to deliver those. So uh, unlike other industries, it means, means you can do something very, very quickly once you've developed it. And, and that's yeah. how the growth has come. Which is significant, because I know in aviation, it, it's quite the opposite um, for, for all sorts of different reasons. But can we just take you back there? Because... You know, back in the 80s and the early 90s, um, the F1 was kind of envious, if you like, of the aviation industry, you know, the, the likes of, I suppose, at that point, it would have been called British Aerospace um, and Rolls-Royce, obviously, uh, and, and what was happening there and the facilities that they had. So what, what happened? What became the kind of the merging of those two? Technologically, but really investment. So more and more income enable them to to employ employ better people. Better people employ even better people. Um, so you know, we, we actually Keith Glover came down to to McLaren one year. Uh, he was doing some work for us, and we had a big photo of all the engineers that came from Cambridge. Uh, and it was a big photo, I have to say. Um, so we'd reached a point in Formula One generally where we were attracting, able to attract and give a good career to, you know, some of the very best engineers from you know, the best universities across the world. Um, it hadn't been like that before. And of course, when you deploy that uh, intellect and that innovation, you know, you deliver results and that's, that's how the sport has transformed itself into the high tech industry is today. So you look at things like uh, fields like aerodynamics, yeah. you know, the, the tools and the techniques that are being, being deployed in aerodynamics in Formula One are some of the best uh, in, in, of, of any industry. Um, and it's, you know, often seen as a reference industry for not only technology, but how to get things done, yeah. how to deliver quickly um, because it, it almost has a, it's, it's a battle, team on team, and that intensity really drives innovation. And in Formula One, I mean, obviously, you, we all know that you've been involved with many of the teams during some fantastic years, tremendous championship wins. So when uh, Nigel Mansell won in 92, uh, right, when, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you were there, and of course, he was... Um, you know, a superstar as far as the Brits were concerned. Um, uh, you know, the amazing driver actually, Nigel. Yeah, yeah. He, he he's he's um, the most fearless driver I ever worked with. Actually, so, absolutely, absolutely fearless and and um, in command of his car, and that's why he was such such an amazing um, driver to watch, as well as you know to see the results he could deliver. So it's interesting that you say that because then obviously you were with uh, McLaren um, and there was a winning streak there and Mika Hakkinen 
you're not British, uh, when in um, 2008 uh, and 99. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, Lewis. In yeah, we had Lewis came in 2007 and he won the championship in 2008. Again, with a then yeah. you switched to Mercedes in 2013 as their yes. chief engineer. And that really, you know, was profound, I think, wasn't it, Paddy? So in 20, just a year later, you took um, Mercedes with Lewis uh, to their first constructors championship. And yes. you know, the rest is history, isn't it? I mean, uh, it's just gone on and on and on and on and yeah, on. Yeah, I mean, they haven't stopped, have they? A little bit of a dent last year, yeah. as we saw the controversy in Abu Dhabi with the Drivers' Championship. Yes. Uh, one of the, what I thought was a shame for me in all of that controversy for Mercedes as a team was um, that the, the fact they'd won a seventh constructors in a row was kind of buried in all the news around Lewis and Max Verstappen. Um, you know, and seven constructors championships in a row is, you know, firstly never done before, but just in, in terms of the human effort and um, the intensity and the, and the perseverance to maintain your competitive, competitiveness over that period in, in what is such an incredibly intense industry it, it is uh, really remarkable. Well, it, it's remarkable too, Paddy, that, you know, um, as you ask anybody in F1 and they say, well, he was a big part of that. And you go, well, you, you, you know, there's Paddy Lowe, uh, chief engineer, and anyone involved in F1 understands the, the significance of the engineering side. In my industry, in media, it tends to be uh, mostly about the drivers and who they're going out with at the time and what they're wearing on their heads. But uh, anyone who's involved in F1 completely understands that, um, you know, that it can't be done like that. What was it, you know, that from 1984, this, this young man who kind of, well, I don't know what I'm gonna do, but I quite like this new thing called computing um, and I kind of like engineering, uh, to genuinely world-class status as an engineer in, in you know, one of the most uh, um, uh, high-profile industries that you can possibly get in terms of engineering. What, what, was there a, a switch that came on that thought, oh, actually, I'm dead good at this. Actually, I want to be the best at this. Was there a switch or was it always really there? Um, I mean, firstly, you're very kind with all of that, uh, you know, credit to me, uh, you know, and it, it is also a team effort. So, you know, lots of other people involved in everything I've done. Um, but to start back on that story, I mean, firstly, my brother was the one who's five years older than me. He's a professor at Imperial College in mechanical engineering. And he, um, you know, he, he was very patient with me because uh, typically I think a five, five year younger brother, you would ignore as a little brat that was a nuisance. But, you know, he always helped me along with what he was doing and he was always pulling bicycles apart or engines or whatever. And I learned all my trade from him as a child. Um, you know, really from very young, we were rebuilding everything we could find. Um, and as I said, you couldn't look up really in those days on the internet about careers. You went to the library and it was all very dry and boring and didn't really explain anything. So I'd, frankly, even when I went to Sydney, I didn't know what an engineer really was. I don't uh, think many of us did, really. Maybe I still don't, but <laughs> it, was, it, it was all a bit of a mystery, but I just followed a path that seemed interesting. And actually, really, my whole career has been like that. It's just one step up the ladder at a time in terms of my, you know, development and my competence as, as an engineer. And, you know, you start to bring up its leadership becomes part of the story as well as engineering itself. Yeah. Um, but it's, it, I've never, you read about people who say, well, I knew when I was 12 that I was gonna be prime minister or something like that. I, I've never had any thought like, you know, I've never seen beyond the next step up the ladder in, in terms of where I was going or why I wanted to go there. Um, but, but in amongst that, you know, I've always had the, the belief just to do the best with whatever you're doing, 
um, the very best and get the most out of it as well. Even, you know, I've done some very, very boring jobs uh, for cash when I was a student or, or even at school. Um, but they all, I remember things from all of them and I learned so much from all of them um, because there's always value in anything you do. And on top of that, I am secretly incredibly competitive. So, ah, um, now we're getting that, to So, I suppose, you know, I mean, I mean, Formula One is all about competition. So, that's, you know, we, we have a saying in Formula One, you know, every conversation, will it make the car go quicker? Because if it doesn't, let's just talk about something else um, that will. Because there is, you know, Formula One has the luxury of being very single, single purposed. Yeah. It, it, it um, almost cannot, cannot fail because the objective is, to win. it doesn't even have to be stated, really. Um, so, you know, I'm competitive to deliver and therefore I guess that rubs off, off into my own um, objectives, um, which are to, to be more successful. But I, I, I don't think I've ever put that first. And I actually used to say this to people because, again, you sometimes get people in the team who see their career as more, more important than the team's objectives. And, and I always felt and would often say that you've got it the wrong way around because if you achieve the team, you know, the objectives of what we're trying to do, your own success will come naturally behind it. Yeah. Um, and that's certainly worked for me. Um, but you, you know you can't replay your life anyway so who knows I, I, I can't say I've got any formula that's the best or uh, particularly yeah, to recommend is. because you, you've got no you've got no control of what else could have happened but I'm, I'm pretty happy with how it turned out so far. <laughs> but it is you know I, I, I love the story about your brother uh, because the natural conclusion would be oh gosh your dad must have been or your mum must have been an engineer, but your father was actually a vicar. Well, he was a clergyman, and we actually we grew up. We grew up in East Africa in Uganda, and he taught at, at a theological college there. So um, he later became a vicar in Kent. Right. Um, and actually, my my dad was very practical um, ah, okay. when he was young, but um, for reasons I don't really know, he kind of gave up on it all. Um, and, and sort of handed it all down to us. And uh, so we did it, Michael and I did it on our own. Um, I want to talk about, you're saying about timing uh, of various things, you know, and, you, uh, and about making the most of what you have at that time. And obviously one of the most important uh, problems at the moment, criti critical problems really is climate change. And that's what you know, we've got 10 minutes to talk about zero petroleum before we go on to perhaps answer many more questions about it. But obviously, I don't need to tell anybody, you know, it, it is often head of the news um, uh, for very good reason for about climate change and energy. And you had this stunning career, world class career as an engineer in Formula One. You left Formula One to set up zero petroleum and um, the principle behind which, of course, is it's fossil free. But just, just in your words, just explain what the ambition of zero petroleum is. Um, yeah, I'll try and keep it brief, but it, it, well, essentially, half an hour. You know, the, problem, the problem we have um, with global warming is the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and that is almost entirely as a result of build-up of carbon dioxide from fossil fuels, combustion of fossil fuels. It's not entirely, you know, you've got things like methane and so on, but um, when I, I look at the world big picture um, and industrial revolution came along 300 years ago or so, and there are many ways to describe it, but you could say it was the harnessing of dense energy media uh, to deploy um, for production, um, a lot of which involves transport, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so we got away from wood, for instance, which is not a dense <laughs> energy medium. And 
Um, but before then, it was a fairly circular system because, for instance, if you use words, you know, you grow more wood, and you know that that's you you're really still integrated with biology. The minute we started digging up fossil fuels, which were our which were the dense formats of energy, um, then we've started creating this imbalance in, in the atmosphere. So I think in a thousand years, let's jump ahead, they will look back on this period, this very interesting transitionary period, where we, we energized ourselves from what's essentially legacy photosynthesis. So the fossil fuels buried underground they just come from that slight imbalance in, in the biological system um, over literally you know, 600 million years. And we've spent 300 years putting a whole, whole load of it back up into the atmosphere. Yeah. And carbon, that is. Um, carbon is a really you know, uh, important um, element, which has a really bad name at the moment, which is curious because we're all carbon life forms. Fundamentally. Um, so we, we prefer to say defossilization rather than decarbonization because we, you know, that's essentially the problem we're trying to, to solve. Um, and carbon should still be celebrated as a really important element in, in the systems. It's funny, when you look, if you look around the room and just discount the glass, the metal and, and the ceramics and so on, everything else, whether natural wood, or plastics or whatever that you're looking at at the moment came from carbon dioxide out of the air, uh, just being assembled <laughs> um, really by biology. So biology makes all those molecules, whether, whether in, in current form or in fossil fuel form. So the missing bit that they will have built by a thousand years from now is actually making all of that, those carbon molecules um, from scratch in real time, rather than um, using all this, these legacy deposits. And that's, that's what's- For me, that's the missing bit. So we talk an awful lot at the moment about electrification, renewable energy, um, but for me, that's only a small part of getting towards a circular system, which is what we need. Circular system being a system where we're not, we're not consuming something to waste, but we're, we're using something constantly and reusing and constantly recycling as as they do in as we do well as biology does i've got a diagram of that actually should i pull it up quickly because it's a, a, what zero petroleum is producing is um effectively fossil free liquid fuels um, yes that's the ambition it's already been proven as i said at the beginning uh the world uh world's first ever uh flight uh in a little icarus um, with the Royal Air Force, uh, uh, didn't have to change the engine at all, uh, just using different fuel, which was fossil free, which was your fuel. That was the world's first ever flight. I mean, it was quite something. It was, it was a hell of a day, that one, Paddy. Uh, Can we get I, the picture up of you, Carol? Yeah. <laughs> That's the flight. Let's do I, that. I cried. I actually cried because the significance of it um, was... Uh, Yes. There we go. There's that the, was the plane. Yeah. Um, that was through in November. Royal Air Force. Why is that not clicking on? There we go. There's Carol. There's me. There's Damon Hill. So, there. Damon Hill. Where's Damon? There's Damon Hill. Yeah. Um, that's me. Out. That's the pilot. The pilot uh, was Willie Hackett. He's the uh, chief test pilot of the RAF. Yeah. Um, so it was, we flew this small plane, which you saw, and it was actually really quite symbolic to have in the background this old British Airways 747, which has been parked there at end of life. Um, and arguably, you know, the best icon of the fossil fuel era, really, 747. Um, so shall we great... go on, Paddy? Uh, just within the next uh, three or four minutes, just briefly explain how this is fossil free and uh, yes. how it works. So, so can I, I'll just show you that, this is just to complete what I was talking about. If you look at um, biology of photosynthesis and respiration in animals, that's in complete balance um, with the exchange of oxygen, carbon dioxide 
and water, which we're all familiar with. And what the, the missing bit is this part here we've called petrosynthesis, which is the, the creation of these petroleum molecules um, from basically from carbon dioxide and water from the atmosphere, yeah. um, rather than pulling them out of the ground as fossil deposits. So if we drill into that, how you would make a fuel, and that can be any fuel or even plastic. Um, so let's say gasoline, which we made for the plane, you take air and perform what's called carbon capture to take out the carbon dioxide. Um, you take water, and you electrolyze that to produce hydrogen um, using renewable electricity. I mean, you could use any electricity, but, but if it was fossil, it would be rather pointless. Um, so take renewable power. Um, most of that energy is actually going into the hydrogen. It's relatively little to, in the carbon capture. But you're now putting hydrogen and carbon dioxide together. You have oxygen as a waste product. So uh, we've still got the same balance of chemistry, same like a forest. Forests uh, you know, absorb carbon dioxide and water and they emit oxygen and, that, and then they synthesize hydrocarbons. And that's exactly what we do in this example, um, but rather than it being a biological process, it's an industrial process. So um, it's, it's absolutely not to be confused with biology. So it's not a biofuel, it's not, you, there's nothing in this page that is biological, but it's, it's a parallel chemistry, let's say, to biology um, and has the same characteristic of being completely balanced because all of your ingredients, the water and the uh, carbon dioxide from air, are the precise ingredients that you uh, emit out of the exhaust pipe when you burn that fuel. So you can do this forever the same way a biology has continued forever in, in generally in balance. So that's, well, that's just something about, yeah, I mean, to those who say, well, let's just electrify everything simply in energy terms. Um, there are many, many vehicles and, and a plane would be an obvious example where the weight of a battery 50 times heavier at the moment, that number may may decrease, but it's not going to get anywhere near equity because one the the, the combustion of fuels is a molecular a molecular process, whereas batteries are all electrochemical processes and they are in a in a different mode. Let's say um, the same way that nuclear processes are in yet another mode of energy density. So that gap won't be bridged. We don't believe certainly not anytime soon, unless something completely different is, is invented for electrical energy storage. So before um, we go to questions, Paddy, just on uh, zero petroleum, obviously we've spoken about first flight ever yes. um, in history, um, uh, using this, this synthetic fuel, uh, which I think is a horrible name for it, because when I think synthetic, I think of I don't know, Ray. Think of nylon or something. Yeah. It, it, nylon sheets. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, dry nylon from the 60s, that kind of thing. Um, I think there's another term that could be used, which is electrofuels, which uh, I think I prefer that one. Maybe we'll ask our audience at some point. Um, but largely, your concentration to start with is on the aviation industry, correct? Um, no, we, we, we're looking at all industries because um, all three fuels will still be the three main fuels we know uh, and use today, gasoline, petrol, diesel and jet fuel. Um, they've all got very important markets which, which will be maintained uh, even in, in uh, the context of electrification, which is absolutely the right solution for many, many applications. So road cars... Uh, personal transport is absolutely the right uh, thing to electrify for pure efficiency uh, at, at the scale we've got to do so. Um, I do wish we'd find, uh, as I'm sure many do, better solutions in terms of the chemistry there, you know, with the, with the, the rare metals um, that are required, you know, lithium and cobalt and so on, which, you know, which we know the story on that. 
Absolutely. Um, I'm going to start but, with some of the questions, Paddy, because that this is yeah. into a question. Um, if we can go yeah, back sure. to our main screens. On this uh, subject that we're talking about at the moment, Dave and Liz say, will synthetic fuel be available for use in vehicles on public roads? In other words, if I you know, trot down to my Texaco garage or Asda or wherever it is that I'm going, um, will I still, will I be using still a liquid petroleum, just something from zero petroleum as opposed to the kind of stuff that we put in now? And if so, in what sort of time scale? I've got some more questions on that as well. Yeah, as I said, we're not primarily aiming at personal transport um, because that the, the right pathway for that is electrification. Having said that, um, I think um, liquid fuel powered cars, let's say, you know, gasoline powered cars will still be around forever, I, I believe, because there'll still be markets where people prefer uh, that type of car and they're willing to pay a bit extra for that um, as long as it's fossil free. So I, I think the markets will remain, not least for the, you know, the legacy, there's, there's, there's many, many classic cars that people will want to run forever and maintain forever uh, and which will need fossil free gasoline. So th this fuel will be available in, in petrol pumps, um, at least for niche uh, markets, niche applications, um, if not more, depending on, on how the, the transition to electric cars pans out. Um, it may not go as quick as is wanted, and so that, you know there's a huge amount of legacy transport there. Um, so timing that, for, for us to get fuel. You know, well, that is one of the next questions. That's the question. Ask, yes. Where will we see the early commercial applications of uh, synthetic petroleum at scale? So aviation is is the most obvious example. So jet fuel for aviation, I think. The, the powers that be are, are now understanding that um, you can't electrify aircraft. Uh, you can electrify very small aircraft that fly short distances, but you know, the, the energy to fly a plane is a function itself of its weight. So if you have a 50 times heavier uh, payload in terms of just the energy, it, it, it's, it doesn't work. Um, so jet fuel will be, uh, has to be provided as a liquid and um, this is supported by you know, many papers. The solution for that will be in synthetics. Uh, there will be some supply from biofuels and some from fuels from waste. So you can make these fuels from municipal waste, et cetera. But to go to scale, it needs to go to this synthetic process, which I've I've shown you. Yeah. Um, because um, that, it, that there is no limit to the scale of that process because the feedstock is the atmosphere. You, you're not dependent on any other feedstock from so, somewhere else. So uh, a lot of questions coming uh, up about the cost and so on, which obviously but, you're in the very but, first. But just to say, I, I mean, aviation is not absolutely not the only one. That's a really important point. Yeah. If I jump to the, an, another complete extreme, a you know agriculture combine harvester or um, a forager, which is a machine which which uh, is a kind of also a harvesting machine. You know some of these machines are over a thousand horsepower, and they will run for 14, 16 hour shift yeah. when it's time to harvest. Um, there's absolutely no way you can electrify a vehicle like that. They're already um, on the limit to go on the land, so. That will, that's another example of, of a market. You know, we all know how important agriculture is. Um, is so it? we see synthetics being, being a big part of the agricultural transition. Um, I know one other part of, because one of the issues particularly for me is that obviously we have, you know, hundreds of millions of cars on the roads, vehicles, I should say, on the roads at the moment, uh, almost all of which aren't electric. And I have a problem with this, like, no, we're going to scrap all of these and start again. I, I, I kind of think, well, I, whoa, 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 surely we should be doing cradle to grave here. Because going yeah. back to when we went to Sydney, you know, back in those days, everything that we had was 
you've got to make it last as long as possible. People will have, you know, got married yeah. with a, a three-piece suite, as it used to be called, as opposed to a suit. Um, and that was to last you for 30 years. Your cars were to last you forever and so on. So that is something that I think isn't discussed in this, you know, utopia, if you like. But Paul, on that subject, is asking fuel. Is there any problem with producing fuel suitable for older engines? I think I saw another question from Paul. I think he's got a, a, an old uh, Lotus Elan Sprint. So, uh, and he said he had problems with E10 or something. Um, I haven't got that up now, but I think that's what he said. But that is another, that is another kind of principle uh, of it too, isn't it? That these older vehicles... Yeah, so the, the, the fuel that, that um, you can make, in fact, that we are making is what's called drop-in. So it will go straight in an existing engine. You know, it is an exact replica of a fossil fuel. Um, or it, I shouldn't say exact because in another way it isn't because it's the same and it isn't the same. It doesn't have sulfur in it, for instance. It doesn't have a lot of the impurities that you get in fossil fuels because they weren't there to start with. If, if you use pure ingredients, which you do, you don't get the impurities. Um, but to answer that question very much, I mean, E10, so to those who don't know, this is the imposition of an ethanol component in pump fuels uh, across Europe at least, uh, which was 5%, it's now become 10%, so that was called E5 now, E10, and in, in diesel you have what's called V7, which is 7% biofuel. Um, that uh, is not great for some old engines. Um, I also think it's a bit of a, it's been a bit of a red herring. Um, done for the right reasons in the first place, but I think you know, as it emerges that biofuels will become increasingly problematic as a solution because they require agriculture. Yeah. And, and there are, you know, already a lot of pressures on agriculture and obviously pressure on agriculture results in deforestation ultimately. Um, so for me, the least, we, least job we give to agriculture, the better. Yeah. Um, the more we industrialize, the better because industrial processes are typically very, very dense, um, controlled, very efficient, and you avoid land use, you avoid biodiversity, stress, et cetera, et cetera. So the E10 that is in your pump fuel is, is a fuel from, is a biofuel, it's ethanol from crops. And it's, uh, I think that ultimately will change as a vector um, and certainly with us, we don't put any ethanol in the fuel. There's no need, you know, we're making a already a fully renewable fuel. So why would we put ethanol in it? Okay. So it's ethanol free. So talking about the impurities, you said there's no sulfur in it. And, and obviously yes. there's more impurities in the fossil fuel. Um, Dave and Liz uh, have asked, does burning of synthetic zero petroleum fuel, in other words, sorry about this jiggling thing, um, still produce uh, uh, some of the um, uh, nitric oxides as, as a byproduct, nitrogen oxide? Yeah, that's a very good question um, because the problem with combustion, combustion engines is not only carbon dioxide and emissions for global warming, but absolutely correct, There's, there are other side effects of combustion that, that are not great. Sulfur dealt with, it's just gone away completely. But nitrous oxides, carbon monoxide, and particulates are, are the other things coming into play. And in, in aviation, you have contrails as well. Yeah. Uh, so those are the effects really. It's, it's steam, in fact. Um, it's water vapor that comes out the back of jets at, in certain conditions at altitude. And itself causes some global warming. Um, early evidence from these synthetic fuels is that all of those factors are much lower. Um, there's not a lot of study on it because there's not a lot of fuels to study. Um, but to the extent that has been looked at, all of those things I mentioned are less. Um, we know, and you, you were at the flight, Carol, even that engine we ran in the, in the plane, um, subjectively, it just smelled cleaner, the exhaust. Um, compared to what we're used to from a petrol engine. And, and the reasons for that are 
are that generally by making better molecules, you get better combustion, better control. More efficient. And this is what will happen. And, and the point is, it, 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 it's a state that will improve as well with time. Um, one of the examples, again, when you dig up a, a barrel of crude oil, um, you have to sell all of it um, because, you know, what will you do with the leftover? You can't throw it in the river. So all of a barrel of crude is used somehow. Yeah. Um, and actually generally in the least refined way possible as long as you meet the specifications. So a lot of the fuels we use today um, have relatively high amount of impurity in there because it, it's, it, it's more expensive to remove it um, and it was present in the source material. With, with synthetics, the cost of making a good molecule is the same pretty much as making a bad molecule. So the science will improve year on year such that we're making better and better chemistries in fuels in time with better and better combustion and less emissions. So talking about the cost, I understand that you know, the cost of making a, a good molecule and a bad molecule is, is roughly the same, but David uh, is asking, thank you, David, what's the cost at the moment of making synthetic petroleum? And I think it has to be understood that this is very, very, very early days. So, um, and how much power does yeah. it use? That, that, basically what the question is. Yeah, um, I mean, we, we, we get asked a lot about the cost, as you can imagine. And, and the first thing I'd say is comparing the cost to fossil fuel is, is kind of the wrong, it's the wrong question because fossil fuel is not an option on the table. So the comparison is to what, how could you do it by another means that would be fully renewable? Um, so in the case of an aircraft, um, then you actually don't have an electrical option. So um, that, that's not an appropriate comparison. But still, people want to know, comparing where we are now to where we could be in, in different sectors. It, it will initially be uh, much more expensive than fossil fuels. Um, I have to say, fossil fuels are ridiculously cheap. If you imagine, you, you know, the, the price of a barrel of oil or price of a litre of petrol um, lower than bottled water, it's lower than milk, you know, it, it's just ridiculously cheap for the amount of energy that's in it. Uh, and we don't really as a society appreciate that so much at the moment. Um, I don't think we do. We, to us, we, it's more expensive yeah. than it's ever been. So, you know. Yeah, but the, you know, the amount of energy in a litre of gasoline is colossal. Um, and you understand that when you realise how much wind power or solar power it takes to make it. So it is expensive in energy. And, you know, that is one of it. You know, that's why electrification, if you can do it, is absolutely the right answer. Because half the energy that you start with from a wind turbine, let's say, to go into making a gasoline, half of it's lost. So the energy in your liquid fuel is only half what you started with. About half of that is lost to make the hydrogen and the other half uh, adding the carbon to the hydrogen. So we see a lot about hyd hydrogen economy and using hydrogen as a solution. Yeah, that and that, that can have its place, yeah. but it, it also has a weight penalty uh, and a very high utility penalty. Hydrogen is very, you know, very difficult gas to handle. Um, it, it, it can leak through very, very small you know, it can even leak through metal. So it's a very difficult gas to handle as well as being dangerous. Um, and it's again, not dense. So that the, the, the density from the other batteries is still reflected, not to the same degree, but still a big factor in hydrogen. And it's not fully efficient either. You've already lost 30% of your energy to get to hydrogen. So it's not as though it's a free bus ticket uh, in that respect. Um, so liquid fuels are not great on the energy, but if that's the only way to do it, um, going back to say the example of a combine harvester, then that's that's the right thing to do. If you've got one second, I, I did a quick count the other month. It is you know will we survive as a race with the amount of energy? Uh, just to get a view because we all need to eat. And if you have 100 acres and you want to cultivate it with machinery, 
uh, you know, how much energy does it take and, you know, how can you generate it? And, and the interesting stat there was if you fueled your machinery with biofuel, which you grew on the field, you yeah. would need 25, 25 of your 100 acres would need to be growing the fuel to run your machinery. So it still works, actually, but it's, it's, uh, that's a big chunk. Whereas if you put a solar panel yes. um, in the corner of the field, it would be less than one acre would provide the fuel to cultivate the 100 acres. Yeah. So that, that sort of um, shows that, you know, that the, this does scale and we, we probably can survive as a human race energetically. Um, it does sound... Until we, until we invent fusion and get fusion. I mean, I'm a big fan of fusion that will come sooner or later. And when we have fusion, you know, it will be highly centralized, almost certainly vast, vast amount of energy. And then how do you get it out to deployment? And I believe you'll be converting it, uh, a lot of it into liquid fuels because they're stored, you can store them, you can transport them, you know, they have all the, all the value that we know and see around us today. Um, that just have, need to be synthetic. We've just got time for another couple of questions, but um, uh, that sounded like you were going back to the very beginning and doing an Oxbridge question then. That, that were given 100 acres and uh, yeah. a certain amount of machine, yeah, yeah. You know, it really was a proper classic. Yeah, we had, yeah, and, absolutely. And, and I'm just going to run through a few questions because I think uh, I just want to credit people with asking the questions if that's okay. Andy has said, Classic vehicles, could you use synthetic petroleum in a conventional petrol engine, or do you need to monitor? Correct. Absolutely, no That's problem. Yeah. That. Um, Robert uh, is asking about zero petroleum, about the business side of it, but I don't think we have time to go into that. I'm sorry, Robert. Uh, so Andy has asked a, a good question. How quickly would carbon capture, as you've described, reduce the... Um, atmospheric uh, concentrations to help the environment? I mean, how, you know, if this was scalable immediately, how many years? Uh, yeah, well, that, that, that's a very interesting, I'll try to be really quick. Um, in the world of carbon capture, you've got two things you can do, what's called carbon capture and sequestration. And they're already doing that in Iceland with, a, with an air capture unit from a company called Climeworks. So that's burying the carbon into rock. You need to get the carbon back into geology not back into biology. Yeah. Um, you know, planting trees doesn't cut it for me. You've got to get it back into the rock. Yeah. And that's, that's sequestration. Um, carbon capture and utilization is what we would be doing. And that isn't, that isn't improving the atmosphere at all because it's just neutral. Net. Yeah, that's it. So we need to do both basically. One, one to undo our sins of the past and the other to move forwards um, without creating more damage. Um, two, quick both... questions. two quick questions. I'm sorry about this. Uh, I'm going back to F1. Jamie has asked, because obviously F1 was in the news again with the new regulations coming in uh, next season. Uh, and I'm sure you still read uh, all the headlines and the background details about that, Paddy. Jamie asks, what's the biggest thing you miss about working in F1, if there is anything? I, I, yeah, I miss the reward of you know, putting something really good on the car, good innovation and having, you know, one of the best drivers in the world um, ring its neck is probably, the, you know, <laughs> exploit that innovation to deliver, you know, an incredible lap, let's say, or a race win, you know, that that's, you know, unbelievably rewarding. In Formula One, the timing sheet has different colours for different numbers as they come up. And, and when you've set the best, it comes up purple. So when you watch one of those laps, there's three sectors, you get three times and you, you know, we've got what you call three purples. If you get three purples, you've nailed it. <laughs> and if you put in the innovation that made that happen and you see, you know, that, that for an engineer is, is incredible. And I've been really privileged to work with amazing drivers. I mentioned Nigel and we've mentioned a few others. Yeah. So it's that combination because it's no good having the great car if, if yeah. 
you know, we saw da Damon is part of what we're doing. He's one of our investors, Damon Hill. Uh, Damon was an amazing driver um, back in the 90s and, and worked very closely with him. Um, He's always my sister's favourite, Damon Hill. She, she went yeah. to and I introduced her to him at one point. It's the only time she'd ever shut up in her life, I have to say. Uh, right, final question, Paddy, I'm afraid. Uh, apologies to everyone whose uh, questions I haven't been able to ask. Uh, Carolyn has said, going back to Zero Petroleum, it sounds like you're leading the way in the UK. Who are your close competitors in synthetic fuels? Um, and how far off is a global change? Just brief answer. I know it's a big question, but brief answer. Competitors yeah, there, there are, and how far There off? are a number of competitors um, around the world. They're, they're mostly in, in Switzerland, Germany, Scandinavia, um, some in the US, some emerging now in California. Um, the, one of the biggest plants in construction is in Chile. And that's uh, Porsche involved in that, um, so that's one to watch. Um, but but actually, the, the the number of plants altogether being built around the world is less than a handful so far of of pure synthetics, or as Carol prefers, electrofuels or e-fuels, they're sometimes called. Um, they that the, the growth is still very early, um, but as I said. For us, that is the end game. That will be the thing that occurs at scale. Um, and this, the, we believe the scale of the petroleum industry will not reduce. Um, it will be the same size. It just won't come out of the ground. It will be being made um, from the atmosphere. How many years, Paddy? Final question. How many years before, let's say, you see, a uh, sake of argument, a British Airways flight uh, taking off in whatever the aircraft is by then, 777 or whatever it is, um, or an Airbus, how long do you think? With, with a synthetic, well, they're, all, they're already running, so SAS, Sustainable Aviation Fuel, it's called, captures all these fuels, so whether bio or from waste or full synthetic. Um, so there are many bio SAFs around already in flight, not in pure form, um, but as blend, and that will increase over the next decade. Ricardo wrote a good report um, in December 2020, and they're predicting that all aviation will be uh, will be sustainable fuel by 2050, and that 85% or more of it will be synthetic, that is electric fuel. Wow. So that that's just, that gives you a guideline for the aviation industry. But as I said, I think we'll see huge growth by necessity in, in agriculture, e even in trains. Um, you know, train you'd think would easily be electrified, but actually it isn't that easy in, in many areas. So synthetic diesel will be a great option for some railways. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that actually, because I, I know just living in Bristol, you know, it's how many years has it taken to electrify? Exactly. You know, I mean, we, we, we want to electrify all the railways, but we've not even done half of them in the UK yet. It will be another 100 years probably to do all of them. Right. Um, uh, so, um, is there a final message, uh, uh, and thank you to everybody for all of the questions, that you want to give to everyone, bearing in mind that most of the people uh, tuned in in this inaugural Sydney Insights uh, little webinar are engineers. Yes. Oh, I should get, so one of my favourite quotes were from Prince Philip, I was telling you the other day, <laughs> um, he, he said, everything not invented by God um, is invented by an engineer, which, which is kind of neat. Um, I guess not quite true, but I like the sentiment. Um, I'm actually an optimist, and there are moments when one might become very depressed about the state of the planet and what humans are doing to it. Um, and, you know, that, that especially to, you know, the young people and we see Greta Thunberg and what she's doing, I've got a huge amount of sympathy for all of that movement. Uh, we need to do more, we need to do it quicker and better. Um, and the engineers will do it quicker and better if they're given the money. So, you know, a lot of the change that's needed is about allocation of, of resources to get on with it. But the more time I spend, you know, in the in this sector, 
the more optimistic I am that, you know, there is a great future, a clean future ahead of us, a circular future, in fact. Uh, and, you know, imagine it will be, I'm sure, beyond my lifetime um, when things are becoming very much circular, if not totally circular. It has to go that way. And, and that's actually a really exciting future if you think about it. We grew up, we grew up in a society that is very conscious of waste. We, you know, we almost feel, well, I do. Uh, even from a young age, when I had my first motorbike, I was guilty, felt guilty that I was burning a finite thing. Mm -hmm. In those days, it was going to run out. Uh, now it's a different thing uh, with the atmosphere. But that. imagine undoing that guilt because you have something where you know in the same way you burn a log in your fire you, you don't feel guilty about that because you know trees can grow again and that's how it's always been so uh, I think we could you know that's a very exciting future ahead well Paddy I'm going to have to draw it to a close because we're nearly 10 minutes yeah. that's a shame isn't it but it, um, it's, a shame. it's been great Carol thank you very much well thank you very much on behalf of everybody uh, listening and, and I'm just going to read a few of the names Cliff to David to uh, Carolyn, Richard, Robert, Chris, Richard, Michael, I mean, Jordan, Dave and Liz, to, and to the more than 130, I think, uh, who've uh, tuned in uh, for this uh, first webinar. Thank you so much, um, Paddy Lowe. And obviously we wish you all the very best uh, with everything that you're doing with Zero Petroleum and, uh, and everything else that's going on in uh, the Paddy Lowe world. Um, and uh, I, I think it's wonderful. I, I'm, I'm delighted that it's two engineers chatting on the inaugural one. I, I'm pleased about that. Are you, Paddy? Yeah, it's terrific. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, engineering is a big part of Sydney. So uh, that, that I think it's uh, really good we were able to do that. It is. Well, I, I'm sure that we'll see you at some uh, dinner or other back at college. But wishing you all the best. Thank you, Paddy Lowe. I shall applaud you on behalf of everybody else. Well, thank you, Carol. <laughs> and th thank you to um, all the audience and thanks for the great questions. Yeah, thank you, Paddy. And uh, that uh, concludes our inaugural Sydney Insights. Um, Carol Vorderman uh, signing off and saying thank you for listening uh, and watching. And this here, just in case you're wondering what that is, it's actually a cow. Um, sitting in a chandelier, who knew? Uh, but um, thank you very much and, uh, and wishing everybody every joy in hopefully post COVID world and that we can all meet up uh, in person at some point soon. Um, and that's all I have to say. And thank you to Sydney Sussex as ever, our beloved college. Um, thank you, Carol. Um, and that really was wonderful. Um, so big thank you to both you and Paddy and we appreciate uh, the insights. I'd like to also thank everyone for coming to the first, uh, the first version, the first episode of this. And uh, we do hope you'll you'll come back and uh, come to the next one. Thank you, thank you, thank you.